Hello everyone and uh, welcome um, to this program this evening. I'm Zoe Ryan, I'm the Daniel W. Dietrich II Director at the ICA and it's my great pleasure to be in conversation this evening with David Hart who is the Carafel Assistant Professor in Fine Arts at the Weizmann School of Design here at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, David, for being in conversation this evening. I am very excited for our talk, the starting point for which is our current exhibition at the ICA. Um, Jessica Vaughan, our primary focus is to be successful. Um, Jessica Vaughan's show is, uh, was curated by um, Meg Onley from the ICA. It's a really brilliant exhibition. You have until May the 9th to see the show. So if you haven't already, go online and make sure that you, uh, you get your free tickets. Um, it's definitely not to be missed. And we thought that we would use this opportunity to use Jessica's show as a kind of jumping off point for David and me to be in discussion, especially around our shared interest in all things related to the built environment. Before I introduce David, however, and before we begin, I want to take a minute to acknowledge the verdict that was handed down um, last night regarding the murder of George Floyd. The decision is a monumental occasion in this nation's history that will hopefully serve as a catalyst for transformation within all segments of society as we work towards the eradication of systemic racism, inequality and oppression experienced by our BIPOC community. The weight of starting a new position like this one at the ICA at this moment of radical change is definitely not lost on me. This year has prompted many cultural institutions, including the ICA, to examine our own complicity in perpetuating racism and what we must do to be an instrument of change. ICA has long centered equity and inclusion as part of our mission, and I'm grateful to have a role in this work, and I'm really committed in solidarity with my colleagues to making ICA a more equitable and welcoming space for everyone. Before I introduce David, I would be remiss if I didn't mention two upcoming programs at the ICA. This Sunday, April 25th at 3 p.m., University of Pennsylvania graduate students Tyler Shine and Amrita Stutzel will facilitate a discussion about materiality as it relates to Jessica Bourne's work. And on Thursday, April 29th from 7 to 8 p.m., please join us for our annual benefit. This is free, everyone is welcome. We, we would love you to join us as we honor Dr. Kaja Silverman, distinguished art historian, and Keith L. and Catherine Sachs, Professor Emerita of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania, and world-renowned artist, Charlene von Heil. Please visit our website to get your free ticket. We would love you to be there to join us in this celebration and to support the ICA. So now turning to David. David's multidisciplinary work includes photography, sculpture, installation, digital film, and today I learned maybe even some furniture. His deeply research-based practice considers the history of social and cultural ideals in relation to the built environment. Past projects include the histories, Old Black Joe, which I had the privilege of seeing last year at his gallery, Corbett versus Dempsey in Chicago, and In the Forest, a beautiful installation that was at the Graham Foundation in 2017. In 2018, David created a site-responsive multimedia installation titled The Histories, Le Montsenilier, at the Beth Shalom Synagogue, a Frank Lloyd Wright designed National Historic Landmark here in Philadelphia. His work is currently on view at the Museum of Modern Art as part of the exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, and it will be on view in New Grit, Art and Philly Now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art from May the 7th, and I can't wait to see that exhibition. David's work is held in museum collections all over the world, including at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is where I first met David, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the National Gallery of Canada, Ottawa, and the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. And David holds an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So welcome, David, 
it seems such a pleasure to be here almost just sort of chatting like we have been over the last few weeks um, about Jessica's show and our shared interest in Jessica's show and especially her critical lens that she focuses on um, the objects and systems that have historically and really governed how labor functions within, within society. And our conversations have sort of picked up very much on a similar interest, I think, in really interrogating the kind of social, political and, and cultural implications of the built environment. Um, and there seems no more time like the present to be really talking about the workplace and the changing workplace and where we might be, especially after the last after the last year, as our home work lives have been so um, radically transformed for many for many people, um, a very challenging moment. But I thought it would be interesting for us both to use Jessica's show as a starting point, but to really understand firstly, David, your own perspectives. Because um, you've described, I think, quite um, nicely to me her work as a catalyst for exploring social systems. And I wonder if you could first maybe just expand on that, but also your own interest in what you've described as using your work as a proxy to unpack ideas that surround race, place, economics and politics. Thank you, first of all, for such a wonderful introduction, uh, Zoe. Uh, and as, as per usual, it's wonderful to be in conversation with you, and this time to have it uh, in public is a great privilege as well. Um, and yeah, so to, to get to your question about uh, my own interest or our shared interest in the built environment and how I use it strategically as a way to explore ideas of, of uh, culture, of identity, of um, uh, a way to perhaps locate these ideas that I consider to be unstable, right? So concepts that are unstable. Uh, the built environment is an interesting proxy as a way to um, perhaps uh, materialize uh, those ideas, that we can see traces in the built environment of decisions, of ideologies, of um, uh, cultural part participation, um, and um, so for me, you know, uh, what I do is I, I, I the, because the work is very much research based, I really start with an idea that I that I, I think is unstable in the sense that um, the way that we understand it is changing, that it's fraught, right? That it's that it's contested, um, and um, uh, as you said earlier as well about this idea of. Um, you know, the way that Jessica's work catalyzes, um, uh, you know, a way to understand these ideas um, that it, 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 it points to, it's indexical, it, it, it establishes a framework within which we can discuss the kind of evolution of those ideas and hopefully gain some clarity in terms of understanding um, what their status is today. Um, and for a specific example, um, you know, um, one that I've been obsessed with for, for, for many years. And in fact, I had, I had created a proposal around it um, several years ago and the, the, the work for whatever reason wasn't realized. But um, I was looking at uh, the early 1970s and specifically Chile in the early 1970s and uh, Salvador Allende's uh, socialist turn at that moment. And I think it's interesting to mention it now specifically as a way to begin to kind of address the role of design in the built environment in service of um, uh, political ideology. And uh, so one of the things that, that Allende did at that moment in time was uh, bringing the best minds available to Chile to work uh, on the socialist cause through designing systems that can support um, worker participation, greater efficiency, um, uh, capitalizing uh, the market in ways that perhaps uh, hadn't been realized yet. Um, so, you know, he brought in um, a management consultant who was an expert in uh, the emerging field of cybernetics, Stafford Beer. Um, he brought in Guy Barzepe, who was uh, uh, recently teaching at um, uh, the School of Design in Germany at Ulm. Um, and together they designed a system called CyberSIM. 
And what was really fascinating about Cybersyn, which was a, uh, a network and as, as well as a kind of control hub that allowed for uh, increased participation uh, by workers, by unions, uh, by manufacturers uh, in determining um, the, the flow of materials across the, the Chilean economy. Um, so it was a system that was rooted uh, in um, uh, early telex te te technology. Um, and what it, it allowed to do was it allowed the mines and the factories to communicate with um, a central economic resource and they could better understand uh, both the needs of the market, but also me means of distribution and also um, uh, workspace efficiency. Um, and so this is a really beautiful example of, uh, and unfortunately it was theoretical to a point. Uh, they got it working to some degree, um, but uh, really didn't have access to cutting edge technology that we have today. And so it remained more of a theoretical model than a practical one. But for me, it's fundamentally interesting in terms of using the power of design to further uh, the ends of uh, an ideological concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, in terms of your own expertise, specifically within the built uh, environment in the fields of design, do you see other examples of um, these kinds of strategies uh, you know, being used in uh, either at a level of government or um, uh, of industry. It is very interesting that you mentioned the Ulm School. And before I, um, I just realized that we, we should have some images, Derek. Is it possible to have them playing next to us while we speak? Um, maybe some images of Jessica's show so people can see can see them as we're as we're talking so they understand you know if you haven't been yet you get a sense of her her exhibition and, and some other pieces that we're that we're particularly interested in and also how she kind of interrogates issues of uh, of labor and, and, and workplace um, it's interesting that you mentioned the OM school and also these kind of Nash um, cross-national conversations, because I've always been interested in um, Thomas Maldonado, who was the head of, uh, um, head of the Ulm School after Max Bill. And he was similarly interested in, you know, kind of removing design from being um, just about being something which was about um, stimulating consumer desire. So moving it away from the kind of marketplace um, to something that had more of a social conscience um, and really trying to, yeah, to determine new relationships between um, design practice and um, human interactions with technology or, or mass media. And it's really interesting to think now when we think of, of design, you know, I really think of design as um, one of the reasons I'm interested in it is I think of it like art in that it's conceptual, it's about ideas. But it's also, I don't see design as just merely a tool for solving problems. Um, in fact, it's, uh, you know, for me, it's best when used as kind of a tool for asking, asking really great questions. Um, and often design ends up being the problem, um, not, the, uh, not the solution. Um, but when I think about kind of utopian projects, I go back to Chicago, which is where we met and um, where we both lived. And she, Jessica is a, a Chicago transplant herself. Um, and I always felt when we were in Chicago, we're kind of li we were living in a modern experiment in a way um, with that city, because of course it was the birthplace of, of modern architecture. And I remember when I first moved there, which was uh, 14, 14 years ago, I remember I was fascinated with the loop, which is this sort of closed loop downtown district that was sort of developed in the 19, early 1900s. Um, and it was called the loop because literally the, the trolley car used to do the loop around the business district and now it was the L. And I used to ride that elevated train, like um, not just to and back from, from work, but also on weekends because I used to just love this elevated um, um, view of the city. But I also just thought how odd it was to create a district like that, how anachronistic it seemed back then. And I remember, uh, um, like five or 5.30 at the end of the day, it would just completely shut down and that part of the city. I mean, the lights would all turn off. There, was, there were no restaurants then or um, people living in that district. Of course, that's changed so much now with people moving in and more amenities. It has a kind of 24 seven um, existence. But I always thought that the, um, the loop as a project, a way of reading how 
commerce or business has such an amazing impact on the on the uh, on the urban frame in that regard and on lifestyles and and uh, yeah how we how we even think about where we live and 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 how a city develops is really fascinating and then the other example which um, I'm sure you know from from Chicago another absolutely flawed utopian project is the um, the Pullman Company Town which was in um, which is in uh, South Chicago which was developed by the industrialist George, industrialist George Pullman of the of the train cars um, and he wanted to relocate his um, his operations south of downtown Chicago um, this was in the late 1880s, and he had plans to, to build one of the, you know, the largest company towns in the United States, which is still there, and has this incredibly um, memorable brick architecture. Um, and he, I think, you know, obviously he had um, good intentions, one could say, partly at the beginning, he wanted to improve the lives of his workers, but he also wanted to make a profit. So he hired um, the architect Solon Spencer Berman to design this entire community, which had you know, a church, parks, a library, a hotel, a shopping arcade. And of course, everybody was meant to spend their hard earned wages back in the company store. Um, and while the town was realized using obviously all the highest construction methods and um, the great project really ultimately failed because um, in I think it was in the in the mid 1890s when Pullman um, he cut wages without producing rents um, and of course this led to you know massive strikes and they had to bring in I think the Federal Reserves um, and again of course the, the whole project collapsed and, and Pullman had to had to pull out and was forced to um, sell the town and I think what's what's probably more interesting is 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 where it's at now you know in terms of like redevelopment we see all these huge projects um you know some people still live there but may, may, mainly it's vacant but we see these huge projects like Battersea power station for example in the in these you know in these parts of, of cities which then starts to you know at certain moments when possible stimulate different types of um yeah, decentralizations, once they come back to life, they become new centers of the city, but of course it takes um it takes so it takes so long. So I think I would I would look at, yeah, definitely just because they're they're still, you know, they're still there. I just find it so interesting that we could really, you know, we were we were like part of the living experiment, especially with the loop. I'd love to ask you a question about um, I think it's I think it's been flashing past on uh, on this slideshow. Um but because we, we both have these uh, experiences of being in Chicago, and one of my favorite projects of Jessica's is actually from, um, it was produced in Chicago. Um, it's these made from these fabric scraps, it's sculptures um, in, in, at the ICA, they are um, on, the, on pedestals on the floor, very low pedestals on the floor, these huge fabric scraps, which are the um, end result of creating the backs and seats of the seats of buses and trains for the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority. And for Jessica, these remnants, these scraps that she shows, um, bear the marks of the, um, the laborers who've made them, the factory workers who've made them, um, while also evoking the, the passengers who obviously ride the, the CTA and sit on these seats daily. Um, and their titles uh, of these works, South Beach Blue or, or Boomer Gray or Carbon Blue, are taken from the names of the, of the fabrics themselves, which have always been you know, they're just so familiar, those kind of jazzy patterns on those on those fabrics that remind me of um, 1980s uh, cinemas in the UK. But you once said to me when we were talking about them, you described them as 50% hide the filth, 50% fake joy, which I think is a completely sad state of effects, but absolutely sums them up. Um, they take me though back to Chicago and riding the L train. I wondered, I can't remember now, but I'm, I'm, I was trying to think what um, connotations they had for, for you and that, and that time spent there. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, the design, it's funny how it reminds both of us of home to some extent. Um, it reminds, growing up in Montreal, uh, it reminds me of uh, Quebec tour buses, the patterns. <laughs> <and the sides of Quebec. laughs> 
and inevitably the jumpsuits that the um, that the um, the uh, the elderly folks who pile off of the buses are usually wearing contain many of those same patterns, uh, oh. unfortunately. Um, but well, here they are on the images. <laughs> here are these pieces, perfect. Um, but uh, on a more serious note, perhaps um, I think, uh, especially given the past year that we've had and uh, a relationship to uh, the role of public uh, transit and specifically who who rides it. Um, I think that there's something really compelling and uh, a deep kind of sense of pathos um, around uh, these stacked materials uh, beyond the kind of direct commentary that, that Joseph is making around um, ideas of uh, the specific laborers working in the factory cutting these materials to make uh, the, uh, the seats on the trains themselves. Um, there's also, I mean, you know, you and I are both at home right now, and we have the great privilege of having conducted most of our business over the past year um, remotely. Uh, but in, in fact, um, uh, most folks who have uh, had to work the front line providing essential services have had to commute and had to rely on uh, public transportation. And in many ways, this pattern becomes a backdrop to their daily commute. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's an important thing to, to kind of consider. And for me, as I said, it takes on, you know, this incredible kind of pathos uh, when we begin to think about the plight of, of those who have to ride and don't have other choices. And usually, are uh, you know, they're, they're traveling from one low paying um, job to another. Uh, before going home just to make it meet. So there's a really deep, um, uh, yeah, the way that labor is entangled in all of these levels, um, I think is, is, is really amazing. And, and, and the way that the work is cumulative too, that it's open-ended, that it doesn't stop, that the Jessica is continuing to collect these materials, I think is also a demonstration of that kind of, almost kind of Sisyphe Sisyphusian kind of uh, cycle of labor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's also a, a phenomenal history of women designers in the field of uh, textile design, like Annie Albers, for instance, uh, who you included in your exhibition, uh, in a cloud, in a wall, in a chair, six modernists in Mexico at mid-century. Uh, do you see a relationship between the high modernism and the affect of these patterns, and the affect of these patterns? Well, I'd like to say it was almost an insult to uh, connect Annie Albers to, uh, you know, some of these fabric patterns, only because I feel like so many of the fabric patterns now, I think, are, are developed by algorithms. And so they're algorithmically developed to, um, so that your eye travels across them but never, you know, is not stopping in one or other place so that you don't see the, you don't see the dirt. Um, and I think that that for me is, uh, well, I guess it connects to modernism and, it, and these are functional, these are functional things, but someone like Annie is, her work is so refined. I think actually more, um, and maybe this is another unfortunate um, comparison, I think more of the, the kitschy, colorful, um work of memphis in the 1980s and they probably wouldn't wouldn't find this un unfortunate this connection they probably think this was good but only because um i think they were really interested in knocking modernism and they didn't want to be um you know i mean in the in the words of um Mies van der Rohe, less is more, they would be more aligned with uh, Philadelphia and Robert Venturi, less is a bore. You know, they just wanted to be, they were trying to introduce much more emotional um, as well as intellectual projects into the world and felt like a return to color and pattern and um, was really necessary to kind of move away from this kind of strict utilitarian, what they thought functionalism of, that had gone before. So, and it's funny to look back at that because now when we look at Memphis, I remember, I think if anyone saw the Natalie de Pasquier show at um, the ICA in 2017, Natalie de Pasquier was a member of, of Memphis and obviously the work is extremely sophisticated, um, the patterns and the, and the objects that they created. 
Um, but I think you see, you, they're obviously now borrowing techniques for this new work, which was very similar. They also wanted to create patterns where there was a lot of movements and your eye was, you know, moving around the, um, around the field of fabric or, or an object. Um, but I remember reading somewhere that Jasper Morrison, who is a very um, refined designer, went to the Milan Furniture Fair and recalls breaking out in a cold sweat when he saw the, um, the work by Memphis, I mean, poor soul. Um, but obviously it was such a break from the past, which now, of course, when we see that these kind of um, patterns is, as I guess Jessica you know, has so um, astutely seen, have just become so subsumed into our kind of um, yeah, daily memories of things. And not just the patterns, I would say, you know, that, that um, really rough um, pile because they're almost like carpet, aren't they, on the seats? You And I recall that on the backs of your legs when you're wearing like shorts in the summer or something. I mean, they just evoke all kinds of connotations of, yeah, of, of being on public transportation for, for good or for, for good or for not good, um, which is, uh, yeah, I think is why there is just so much in, in, in Jessica's work that's just so interesting to, to unpack. I wanted to go, um, there was a um, project that I know, Derek, maybe you can find the images of the depreciating assets, burial dimensions projects. Um, because as we were talking over the last couple of weeks, David, you kept bringing me back to these sculpture works. Here they are um, by Jessica. And I also was really fascinated by these pieces in particular, um, perhaps because they are so, deeply connected obviously to the history of, of design and, and, and they're sort of, you know, they could be parts of cubicles, they're parts of office furniture, things we sort of equate. You know, I'm thinking of the 606 universal shelves behind me by Dieter Rams, which are similar and obviously have this whole history. They are for me very connected to the history of modernism and modern buildings and, and how you carve up model buildings for, um, for habitation. And I wondered, yeah, what, what strikes you so intensely about, about these pieces? Yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, they're, they're fantastic works. And for me, it was, um, um, I think that the, in many ways, they kind of catalyzed my understanding of her practice um, in, in so many ways in terms of um, uh, the specific art historical references that she was leveraging. Um, um, as a form of critique. Um, and I think that, you know, what's interesting and uh, perhaps kind of concurrent is the history of minimalism and the history of conceptual art. And in many ways, uh, the practitioners uh, overlap, you know, when you think of uh, folks like um, Carl Andre or Sol LeWitt, but they overlap both, um, uh, both as conceptual artists, but also kind of operating within the language of, of minimalism. Um, and, and so I think, you know, the way that, that Jessica is borrowing uh, in terms of the formal vocabulary of minimalism, but very, very specific references and, 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 and also um, uh, the use of ready-mades, things that already exist in the world um, that are being adapted and edited um, into an art context. Mm -hmm. um, so there are very specific kind of um, analogous kind of um, uh, points that I make when looking at the work. So in the case of, you know, depreciating assets and variable dimensions, um, you know, the assembly permutations of an office cubicle uh, framework reminds me of uh, Solowit system, systems-based art, artworks, right? That you begin with um, a set of parameters within which you operate to create, uh, to create the artwork. Um, and then uh, the uh, 55, 15, uh, the dot matrix printouts uh, with the job titles and the wages uh, associated with them uh, very much reminds me of uh, Carl Andre's concrete poetry. Um, but whereas uh, in the case of both Lewitt and Andre, uh, there's no critical dimension there, right? It's, it's, it's much more of a, an aesthetic or formal set of explo explorations to ask the question, what if, and to see what happens and to, to play. Um, and I think what Jessica is doing is taking those rules, but the, applying them to things that, that um, she feels uh, need to be explored with a kind of rigor that the language of conceptual art uh, allows for, right? Repetition, uh, scale, um, volume, 
Um, all of these things are being expressed to see, um, you know, thousands of job titles, some of them dead end, most of them dead end, um, with fixed salaries next to them. I mean, this is a kind of litany of, of hopelessness almost, um, but it, 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 it builds to a kind of, um, uh, there's a cumulative results um, that, um, that one also senses when, when looking at Louet or, or Andre. But I want to switch your pivot perhaps to, uh, to um, at, at least in my mind, subjectively more interesting artists, um, Han Darbalvin and uh, Adrian Piper. Mm -hmm. And I think that these are both also uh, highly operative uh, reference points uh, for Jessica in terms of how she operates. Um, so, you know, with somebody like Han Darbalvin, uh, the idea of labor, again, being expressed literally within the work through this kind of act of repetition, uh, uh, but also being pr presented as this overwhelming kind of volume of evidence, right? And the way that, that, um, uh, that Darbalvin kind of questions um, uh, ideas around gender, uh, ideas around um, uh, the hierarchy of ideas um, when considering uh, uh, enlightenment, the enlightenment, right? And I think that uh, in many ways, Jessica is doing the same thing with, with many of the conventions that we have and perhaps some of the at utopic attitudes that we have around um, uh, the trajectory of, of modernity, mm -hmm. uh, which are deeply connected to um, uh, the ideals of, of the enlightenment, uh, but perhaps towards their kind of perverse ends, or as I like to say, a kind of history for those potentialities. Um, and then, you know, with Adrian Piper, again, using, you know, the language of, of institutions uh, to analyze how institutions mm -hmm. to isolate or systemically uh, bar uh, specific communities uh, from participating. Mm -hmm. So about, um, you know, the introductory video piece that um, we're presented with, um, at the entrance to the exhibition with a piece like Adrian Piper's Cornered, uh, we begin to see the way within, we begin to see the way and the language or the lexicon of ideas that are being expressed by the institution to communicate our place within it. Mm -hmm. Should we call up those images again, David? Derek, I think it'd be, it'd be nice to see the images from the show again while we're, while we're speaking so people have a frame of, uh, of reference for some of these some of these works. So I just I'll get to, a, um, I want to ask you a question. Um, so it's interesting that Robert Propp's action office system from 1967, Herman Miller, was being developed almost concurrently with the move towards the, the dematerialization of the artwork uh, and the advent of conceptual art. Uh, Lucy Lepard uh, marks the year as 1966, and Sol Lewitt characterizes the ideation process as coding. Uh, can you talk about the shifts in office culture and the innovation of Prop's system? They're so interesting because I've never really thought about those two together. Um, but then when I heard you talking about, um, yeah, works being systems or systems within which you work, of course, that is what also the, the office culture of that time was trying to be. I guess it was a bit of a dematerialization in terms of the action office. Um, but I'd never really yet brought the, um, those two worlds colliding um, in my mind, and the, you know, conceptual art and the, and the, and the same time as the, the action office being developed. Um, of course, the most major and was a major uh, shift happened in the fifties with the you know with the history of tall buildings and you know structures like within the loop, like inland steel or others, which were these sort of you know clear span constructions with the with the columns or the load bearing columns on the outside. So you had these completely you know free um, floor spaces, which then of course. Um, they were trying to, you know, inhabit, carve up and inhabit. And I think they were, you know, at that point wanting to move away from like the rows and rows of, of desks and typewriters like you would see in um, the Johnson Wax building, you know, um, by Frank Lloyd Wright or, or in the film, the, the Apartment from like 1960s, you know, just these rows and pom rows upon rows. And you had people like, um, yeah, Herman Miller, with George Nelson at the helm and Robert Prost, um, really thinking about the rise of the office clerk um, and 
really thinking about like what it what it was to be to be in an office and how unhealthy that was now with the kind of rise of, of white collar um, office jobs and trying to think about you know other formats um, to carve up space and they um, developed the action office which was a suite of furniture it was the first that would have allowed workers to really um, customize and, and format their spaces themselves with all these different component parts and it was made from formica which was of course a new material easy to clean um, it was colorful and well built and but it was completely like prohibitive prohibitively expensive so the thing was an absolute flop when it first when it first came out and then they made the action office i think 2.0 and it was uh, had a, a much more popularity um but i think that the sad thing about the action office is you know if you think now that we're beginning to have like standing desks and other ways of i mean all these ideas stem back to that but it's only now so much more recently that we've really taken this more seriously um, and the other thing that I think, you know, is, is very sad about the action office is obviously seen as sort of the, you know, we couldn't make customizable office environments. So that's how the cubicle kind of got defined much more like the efficient kind of carving up of space. And I'm not, I'm not convinced that the action office really prompted the, um, the cubicle, but it is funny to think about, I was, I was looking at um, Herman Miller just launched the OE1 which is the, um, I think it stands for Office Equipment One, which is by Sam um, Hecht and Kim Collin, which of course harks back to kind of, you know, these modernist systems, OE1 being, you know, sounds very functional and utilitarian. And, and again, it's made from different component parts. And it just makes me laugh to think how many times that Herman Miller has kind of, you know, been reinventing this and, and inventing this. But some of the designs really hark back the nooks that you can have or the, you know, more mobile, um, meeting places and other things are just ideas that are completely drawn from from that period but obviously into our new kind of much more mobile working environments no it's fa it's fascinating to to think about um to think about these things as they sort of evolve over time and also to think about them in in relationship to to jessica's yeah to jessica's work and um these ghosts of the uh of these parts and the kind of, yeah, they're eerie, for me, quite eerie, eerie connotations. Um, it's interesting that, um, we, you know, you and I have talked a lot about um, not just the kind of the, in, the interiors, but also how, you know, new business models or, um, you know, new, new offices, I think, I think of the loop, I think how the, the building defined the interiors, you know, there's then these, these cubicles that were then breaking up these kind of um, big modern offices, um, but obviously how they've really superimposed on the built environment. And we're often talking about how different business models or, um, have changed how we communicate but also how we how we think about um, how a place is structured and how they leave an imprint on the on the urban realm and this is such a thing that you've also thought about through through your own work and have explored projects in Chicago too um, I'd love to hear more about that from you sure yeah I think I mean um just want to perhaps touch upon because I think that there's an important, um, you know, going back to this notion of, of the proxy and what does depreciating assets stand for, right? So I love it pointing both to uh, the objects, the sculptural objects, but also an attitude of uh, commitment and accountability towards the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so recognizing human resources as um, uh, a function of accounting, really. Right, and that uh, the workers are in fact depreciating assets uh, in some kind of perverse way as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to that extent, um, you know, I think it, the model that Jessica is representing is deliberately anachronistic, mm -hmm. right? We actually find examples um, such as these in uh, contemporary workplaces is actually uh, more and more difficult, right? You might see it at a, a large financial services back office or in a government agency, uh, but in you know um, the field of, of tech um, or um, uh, definitely design, 
Um, there's a brand new language of uh, office space design mm -hmm. uh, that has emerged. Um, and uh, so I think it's important to kind of just kind of situate where the work kind of operates in terms of, of, of that design language. Um, you know, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Olimaris, uh, works as a consultant for um, Vitra. And he did a fantastic, I believe it was Jonathan who did this fantastic new office system for them, um, which is basically interchangeable panels of OSB oriented strand board. Um, so in many ways, just kind of using the kind of ad hoc kind mm -hmm. of system that artists use all the time in terms of, you know, creating their own kind of studio environments. Uh, in, in many ways, that's been that kind of flexibility or immediacy has been adapted by workplaces in order to to accommodate the emerging needs of, of this contemporary workforce. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'd love to actually uh, just hear you talk a little bit about that kind of that trajectory. I mean, you know, there's the, the model of Shiat Day, uh, you know, what is back in the 80s that Frank Geary and, um, and Peche designed for them, the kind of the hot desk and the, um, you know, the totally uh, mobile uh, workspace that was uh, the opposite of kind of personalization, but in fact, this kind of, um, uh, it was based on kind of temporary residency. What kind of models do you see uh, emerging that are relevant and perhaps have something or nothing to do with uh, the models that Jessica's pointing to? You know, I, I, I find that very interesting what you said about the anachronism, because it's still so, it still seems so present you know, even though we're searching for all these new, new systems. And I, you know, the Shiat Day um, advertising offices that um, Pesci designed in, in New York, of course, what was interesting about them, and I think he called them virtual offices, you know, you would, um, well, there was a locker at the front and you would like put all your belongings in the locker and like check out a computer and a phone and then sort of, yeah, the hot desking idea, which, um, you know, this is the mid early to mid 90s this was just even even for shiat day and the, and the and the advertising crew this was just found to be far too outre and they also didn't like the um they found it far too um distracting this was one of the major major complaints and then they had to go back to you know because obviously there was one of the first real open plan offices um they had to go back to something a little bit more um um traditional um, but of course, it paved the way for for now. What do we see? Campuses for the Apple and the Googles, with um, yeah, entire lifestyles being um, developed within within the offices to try and uh, to try and keep you there and and hold you there. Um, and I, I yeah, I'm curious to see how our own virtual offices now that we've been um, you know so many of us has been working for home, or for those that aren't um how how we will think of the of the office differently or, or not um as as uh, as we enter this the kind of post covid period what we hope will be the post covid period and i wonder how patterns of work will shift i mean for me my neighborhood has become you know such an important part of my life that it that more so than before which i think is really important but i but i go back to the kind of loop the kind of what will happen to these very centralized kind of business districts if we decentralize that and we are literally hot spotting or hot seating or hot desking you know at all kinds of places around around the city how that will impact yeah city development and and growth and and other things um but I was, re I, was t I was talking to the team today at the ICA and I was, I was reading this article um, recently in the Harvard Business Review on designing the hybrid office, which people will be um, obviously thinking about, thinking about now. And actually they were saying how important it is to really bring people together and things like um, kind of casual conversations and hanging out by the water cooler, which was often seen as, you know, not something you should be, uh, you should be encouraging, will actually need to be encouraged because those are the spaces, the kind of informal conversations where you get really good, you know, good ideas, you generate discussion, you get to know your colleagues, you're, you're building trust, the kinds of things you cannot do over, you know, virtual platforms. Um, 
So I'm really interested to see how, I think they said more office designs will be designed around these kind of human moments where people can, well, can interact with one another. Um, so it's gonna be really, yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see how, um, to see how things things develop and how many other variations of the action office we can uh, we can come up with um, to try and create these human these human moments. Um, we, David, I know we've, we've got short amount of time. I left. was going to say, yeah, should we pivot and see if we want to take questions? Does that make sense? Yeah, if people have questions, we'd love to take questions. Um, Oh, good. Thanks, Natalie, for asking. Um, it was interesting. I was really interested in what you said, David, because we talked a lot about, and I talked to Meg about this, about Jessica's work. Um, one of the things that we talked about is, is, is Jessica's interest in minimalism. Um, and, you know, obviously there's this um, several pieces in the show that kind of um, think about this. Um, However, when I think about minimalism, it's so self-referential. You know, it's all about the internal logic. And you sort of you sort of alluded to this and, and, and talked about this, about whereas Jessica, Jessica's work to me interfaces so explicitly with the world. And I wondered, yeah, from your perspective, if you could talk about that in terms of is Jessica's work a kind of reconsideration of modernism or, or, or modern art? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting, and I, you know, I think the work kind of oscillates back and forth between both of those realms. Um, you know, the space of minimalism, which, as you said, is very much kind of insistent on on the materials themselves. I mean, that was something that Judd was famous for. The you know, the sculpture is what it is, and um, uh, and then and then there's the you know the conceptual framing that um, that, that artists like. Um, Sol Lewitt or Han Darbalton or Adrian Piper were, were insistent on. And um, I like the way that, that Jessica kind of toggles back and forth between those two kind of potentialities um, in interesting ways. Um, because at the end of the day, um, uh, I think that that is also the function of indexical work is that it is pointing at something, but it's also talking to uh, the way within which that thing came into being. The way that it is uh, conceptualized, the fact that it is a ready-made, that it already has these kind of attendant histories that it has to has to contend with, um, and so um, you know, I think that there's there's a, a beautiful kind of sleight of hand, if you will, uh, in terms of um, using these almost kind of like judo, where you kind of turn your opponent's strength back at them. Um, the way that you know she is using uh, the the traditions of minimalism and conceptualism, but but flipping them out to, to, to operate as a kind of critical framework within which she can discuss these other ideas that are out there and important. No, it's fascinating. I love the reference to judo. Another reference outside of, uh, outside of art, but definitely in the world. If there's, um, I, I will throw out one other question because I, I feel like so much of when we were talking about this work, we kept coming back to our own roots and I think it was um, mostly related to the idea of what, what you expressed articulately to me David though the idea about the social contract this idea in the sort of 18th century um, that philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, conceptualized that we have an obligation to one another and we should organize society accordingly which is a you know when you think about that concept today in, in this um, extremely intense moment um, where we're grappling with so much, quite rightly so. I come back to this um, because I think that, that Jessica's photographs, I think one of the, one of the pieces we talked earlier about um, together, especially those photographs of everyday objects that have become Kind of subsumed into our into our daily memories. I think of the post the images of the post office boxes. Um, you mentioned the dot matrix printouts of the um, salaries of, of hourly workers. Um, you know, especially these these pieces that are um, so pertinent to our yeah to daily existence. 
you know, I'm from the UK where the Royal Mail is seen as sort of a national treasure. So the idea of the social contract is something, you know, quite different in different contexts. And you, you know, as you said, are from, um, from Canada. And I wonder to what degree you think your entry points into Jessica's work are, are framed, I think, by that, you know, your own cultural background. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the, the t remind me of the title of those, The Empty Bins. Uh, is it Empties? Empties. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, you know, such a, a laden uh, uh, title. Um, but I, I think in Canada, it's much the same uh, in terms of the post office being a symbol of national pride. Um, I, I remember um, as a perhaps young man, uh, when uh, Kareem Rashid, um, who designed the pod restaurant, which whose design still survives today, I believe, uh, hoping that it, it uh, survives the pandemic. Uh, but Kareem Rashid, a Canadian industrial designer, re redesigned the, the mailbox. And it was a, a huge moment of pride in the same way as um, uh, Expo 67 was, which was the year I was born, but as a kind of symbol of, of uh, uh, Canada's relationship to the spirit of modernity. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so when Rashid designed the mailbox, it was, you know, you could see it on every corner, this kind of symbol of Canadian pride in, in that institution. Um, and there was also equally uh, an enormous amount of controversy, which is still ongoing, in fact, uh, when uh, uh, the post office, the Canadian post office, decide to, decided to implement these super boxes. And super boxes are um, uh, essentially PO boxes, the PO boxes that are distributed around the neighborhood. So instead of having the mail come, uh, the mailman come and deliver the mail to your front door, they deliver it to the super box, and then you, on your way home, stop and pick it up. And so uh, uh, many Canadians felt this was a betrayal of the social contract. Right? This was uh, neoliberal forces at work undermining. Um, basic services that uh, that should have been provided uh, by the government. Um, you know, it, they saw it as their tax dollars at work. And why were some neighborhoods being served uh, yeah. with hand delivery and others had to make do with these super boxes. So the way that, um, you know, I think Jessica has identified um, these kind of systems of infrastructure and how they represent uh, in a very direct and immediate way our relationship with government as an entity that provides um, and, and responsible for this idea of the, the, the social contract. Um, so if we define society as you know, having three sectors, uh, government, business, uh, and civil society, uh, which is family in the private sphere, why is it that we only judge the quality of something based on its administrative uh, or financial results, mm -hmm. right? which is, I think, uh, the plague of neoliberalism, which is constantly evaluating things based on those criteria. Um, you know, and I think uh, there's been, you know, all of this uh, news recently on NFTs and their relationship to the blockchain. Uh, but the blockchain is, uh, and blockchain tech is actually the apex of this narrow-minded dead-end logic, right? It's a digital traceable ledger of financial worth. It's an empty signifier. Right, one that uh, exists simply to allow institutions to track this kind of idea of value that is rooted within, you know, a very um, a specific sphere in terms of how, you know, value is actually really understood uh, societally. So I'd rather uh, measure exclusively the collective health, intelligence and curiosity of the public. And uh, you know, perhaps we should be supporting the institutions and perhaps this is what Jessica is pointing at uh, that ensure positive results in those, you know, in those sphere, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we, I think we, we also have to remember that the post office saved America. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I know that that wasn't, you know, in Jessica's mind when she was making the work originally, but um, it becomes a kind of emphatic point uh, today. Mm -hmm. It's funny thinking of Karen Rashid designing the um, post boxes because I think he designed um, newspaper stands in New York. Oh, okay. And it reminded me of a, a conversation that we had a while ago about um, authorship in design. 
and in, in, and in other countries where yeah designers are really kind of lauded as uh you know i remember when the the two pound coin came out in the uk or stamps or other things that you really know who the designer is i mean they've written up and in, in other countries too which i i always bemoan the um yeah that that doesn't happen more here you know the kind of uh um the celebration of that as a which is it's almost a thing in itself you know celebrating these things as uh yeah moments to, and and cultural moments mm -hmm. um cultural moments of the everyday which is just so important because as jessica quite rightly says they become completely subsumed into our into our daily existence much more than uh much more than many other things so david it's been always a pleasure i feel like we bounce from one topic to the next just seemingly quite quite a seamlessly um but it's it's always a pleasure you are a brain my friend um with so many reference points that are just so yeah just so interesting and um yeah thank you very much to you thank you so much to jessica um for entrusting her work to us and her ideas and and for this fantastic exhibition that i urge everybody to uh to make an appointment to come and see before it closes on may the 9th um it's just yeah it's been a real joy to have this project and congratulations to meg only the the curator of the exhibition so thanks david thanks for being here my pleasure